Recently I was having a conversation about a variety of really interesting topics such as how society has changed over time, neurodivergence and media portrayals with my best friend, and partly through I realised you could make a video out of this. So I did. Some very quick admin before we get started. Everything I or my friends say in the conversation, and yes I will be voicing both sides because I don't want to trap my best friend in a recording studio for hours, will be in a Discord comment on screen, but I'll also add some separate thoughts on each thing. Names and other personal details have been edited to protect the innocent along with the guilty, and I'm going to be skipping over some things that are too personal. Oh, and there are content warnings at the start of each chapter. Not all these messages are quite in order because I'll say some things around my friend saying something different at the same time sometimes, and it is a lot easier to follow if I move the order. Finally, I know that non-standard English is hard to read for some people. If you need captions in mostly standard English, they're available in YouTube's caption system, even when something is already on screen. It's normally pretty good at getting captions up within a few hours of upload, but if you can read the actual things we said, I think it adds to the meaning of a few things. Chapter 1. Changes over time. Content warning for homophobia, transphobia, Islamophobia, and 9-11 mentions. God, imagine telling people who were like, even five years younger than me, like actual factual adults now, about all this stuff they don't even know is real because they weren't there. I feel old. I mean, we're still in our twenties, that is, in fact, still super young. I wouldn't worry. Yeah, I guess, but still, it's weird how much of a generation gap there is, even between people who are not really in different generations. Yeah, it's strange. Like, it feels like stuff like flip phones is from over two decades ago now, with how quickly they became obsolete, but really they were still in use until about the 2010s. So, not all that long ago. Time isn't real. I know, because I had one in the 2010s. <laughs> exactly! But now there were babies with iPads? Indeed. Maybe iPad kids wouldn't be a phenomenon we see all the time now if parents had time to spend with their kids. <laughs> also, I am probably the youngest person who remembers 9-11 because I was three. Almost four, but three. I don't even remember it, I was like two. Yeah, like, just think. There was a time when you could ask people what they know about Muslims, and get, like, not big fans of pork, or, I don't know, they pray to Mecca five times a day, right? Rather than... Bleh. This conclusion is shamelessly stolen from one of Mason Tailstake Williams' commentaries on one of his comics in the Leftover Soup series. If you can get past an early joke that's just bad and shouldn't have made the script, it's pretty decent. And although it is definitely a white man's perspective on a lot of social issues, it's a self-aware white man's perspective on a lot of social issues. And the storyline is good. Wild. Honestly. Also, like, so, also on the prejudice note, some of the people in the LGBTQIAB plus group I'm in are, like, 16, and, like, they don't remember, like, properly intense homophobia in the way I do. Like, same-sex marriage being debated? <laughs> they were eight or nine! Yeah, that's always a wild one. My time at secondary school especially was so scarring for me because of how normalised homophobia was. Right? It was horrifying, for real, I envy them. <laughs> and, like, I learned what trans even was when I was older than some of these people realised they were. And, yeah, I envy them too. Like. To be honest, the amount of progress being made is wild, even if everything's still horrible and trash. Yeah, really, they're baby steps, but they're very fast baby steps. I am not going to read out all of our keyboard smashes. <sighs> okay, fine. D S D F S K F D. Are you happy now? Are you not entertained? Yeah, exactly. Only baby steps in some directions, though. B 
being trans in this country is still hell. Okay, this bit is boring, we complain about how being trans sucks for a bit, let's move on. You know I worked at, like, a special school for autistic people for a while. I don't know if it was just that autistic people are nicer or what, but, like, there was an openly trans guy and his ex-girlfriend who dated him when he still identified as a girl, and everyone was just like, okay? Like, and that's it. That's the whole reaction. Chapter 2. Neurodiversity. Content warning for bad stereotypes about neurodivergence, also mention of crime in the abstract. Autistic people don't really get social cues and norms for the most part, right? So that's probably part of it. I mean, we do. <laughs> but like, I don't know, it was just most people were nice about it. Someone I know is autistic too, and she alone is proof that folks on the spectrum do have empathy, unlike how neurotypical see you all. Isn't hyper-empathy actually a symptom in some people? Yeah! Oh my god, so someone I know who is autistic is so empathic, they will break down crying if anyone starts violence because they cannot deal with it. I'm gonna hold out my right hand and turn back time here because this conversation is actually two conversations happening past each other. Also, 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 not having empathy does not mean being a bad person. Yeah, it's, um, neurotypicals are wrong about neurodivergence, actually. <laughs> also, you know a specific group of people, right? And one of them is actually factually zero empathy, but so what? Like, I know that person is a jerk, but it's not that much of a jerk. Yes, this person uses it, it's pronouns, stay mad about it. Also, we do have its permission to talk about the stuff, we're not just exploiting some random friend for clicks. I've met much worse than it. <laughs> exactly, but like, it's technically a psychopath because of zero empathy and other things. But obviously psychopath gets misused as a term so much. But also being a psychopath doesn't necessarily mean being immoral. Exactly. It's a brain thing, nothing else. Sociopaths too, for real. Yeah. But people think psychopath is like serial killer. Like, don't get me wrong, sociopaths are often manipulative, like at a higher percentage than average. But like, just judging someone like they're an instant lost cause is a self-fulfilling prophecy, actually. Maybe that's because that's how they internalize societal expectations. The problem is never really the person, is it? Yeah, exactly. With the right support, anyone can be fine, actually. Very simple concept. Like, also, there's this piece of research I saved somewhere about how, like, the psychopath test was made originally to be a measure of how likely someone is to reoffend after they've done crime. And it turns out that they actually tested it. And there is zero evidence that psychopaths are more likely to reoffend, and like no evidence that they don't get what morality is. I misremembered the exact results of the study. There is a very slightly higher chance of reoffending, but not enough to justify the use of the test. Psychopaths and non-psychopaths have far more in common than what differentiates them, and I assume we can all agree that this difference can hardly justify calling the one group ordinary offenders and calling the other group extremely dangerous predators. I also forgot the second conclusion of the study, which is that there is no evidence that psychopaths are unresponsive to treatment and rehabilitation efforts. Actually, there were positive results across intervention methods that mirrored progress in other offenders. The third conclusion was about conscience and morality. First. We were unable to find a single empirical study measuring conscience in psychopaths. This was especially surprising since the most read and cited book about psychopaths is entitled Without Conscience. How can scientists claim to know that psychopaths lack conscience if they have never attempted to measure it? And across multiple studies, psychopaths did not show any difficulties in making moral judgments. This guy is Vasmus Larsson, and he explains this and other results of the study, including the horrifying discrimination against people branded as psychopaths, in a video that I will link in the down there bit. Anyway, let's get back to the conversation. Just a bunch of nonsense, like always. 
there's a pattern here. I wonder what it could be. Like, <laughs> the psychopath friend we were talking about would give the same answers to a morality test as I would, pretty much. At least about what it thought the correct course of action was in a situation. It might actually be more likely to say, and I would do it if I were in that situation in real life too. Because being a psychopath actually means getting stuff done that's right, rather than just that, like, feels right. What a concept. I have no sources for this view of psychopathy, but then neither do most of the people who think they're qualified to talk about it. So... Chapter 3. Minority Portrayals in Media Content warning for depression discussion, bad representation of neurodivergence, bad representation of LGBTQQAIP plus issues, and bad representation of race, brief mention. Very slight spoiler warning for Dreamscaper, which is actually a good game. Spoilers for Life is Strange, which is also good, but I'll give you timestamps to avoid major ones. Honestly, like, the way that people assume that neurodivergent people are, versus the way that we actually are, is so whack. Like, talking about autism as though that seer thing was in any way accurate. Or, like, for dissociative identity disorder. Split. Which, by the way, is... Uh, I'm not going to go deep into this because the information on this is all over the internet, but Music is a horrible film by the musician Seer, which seems determined to fit as many harmful misconceptions of autism as possible into one film about it. Just... Don't watch it, don't cast non-autistic people who don't know what they're doing as autistic people, and don't restrain autistic people if they're having a meltdown unless they are an actual danger to people around them, and only to the extent needed to avoid that danger. Split is a film about someone with multiple personalities. Similarly, it promotes harmful misconceptions about people with dissociative identity disorder. Do not watch it. Yeah, what if DSJS DKD the seer thing? Jesus Christ, that got me so mad. And she got off scot free. She got nominations! You know the Autism Speaks were like, we disavow? Because even they were like, nope, we are not associating with this nonsense. <laughs> I didn't know that. That is peak embarrassing. Yeah, honestly, I feel like. Every time neurotypical people make a show about neurodivergent people, it's always... How to put this? Bad. I-S-J-K-D-S-D-K. You're right, and you should say it. Also, like, 13 Reasons Why is a bad show and is so bad when it comes to mental health and suicide. So it's not an episode. Oh lord, the way they had the audacity to put out a second season. Also, I feel like most shows that tried to talk about depression too, they're either violently unhelpful to the point of harm, or offer nothing but empty platitudes. Like, didn't Twilight or something decide to have the main girl suffer from depression, and then suddenly the moment that Sparkly Vampire shows up, she's suddenly cured? Literally. Which is like, not how depression works. Like, you can be in a loving relationship and still have depression. You can be in seven loving relationships and still have depression. Like, I've been feeling awful, even with my fiancé, like, right there. But I think that with this kind of media, they need to frame stuff as having, like, a solution? And preferably one that happens in one to two episodes tops. Yeah, exactly. Mainstream narratives need a clear cut beginning and ending that makes the mainstream audience go smiley face. So we either get trauma porn or simplistic narratives. That goes for everything, really LGBT, race, other political issues, etc. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be fed slop that doesn't even acknowledge our existence properly and then be thankful for it. Yeah, I think there's a few films and games that handle stuff like that well, and mostly it's just by having that stuff be, like, there. But it never gets resolved, 
like it's just a part of the world and there's no start or stop to it. It's unfortunately a verity in media. Like, uh, Dreamscaper is a game that has a mental health theme, and yeah, the actual gameplay is escapist, dream whatever, fight your nightmares by dreaming of a sword and hitting them in the face with it, but the actual conversations your character has are built up really well in my opinion. Like, there's a clear start and end and resolution, and it follows the standard narrative arc of things start out okay and then they get worse, then better, then a lot worse, then a lot better. But it's done in a realistic way with the conversations. Like, you're going through a depressive phase and coming out the other side, but the end isn't, and now she doesn't have depression. It's, and now she has a few friends and a semi-stable job, and is trying to learn to love herself for what she makes. We discuss roguelikes and roguelites a little. Play some of them beyond just Hades, please. But yeah, I loved how Going Under did, like, LGBT stuff. Or, like, B stuff. Not much LG or T there, <laughs> but like the two bi gals and the fact that you can just date men or women and that's just a thing. We take our wins where we can. SDJ, SDK. I'm pretty sure I keep recommending this, but did you ever play any of the Life is Strange games? No, I haven't. Consider them added to the list. You should! Every main character is bi, and there's just like, so much representation. They do a weird thing at one point where they imply that white people have spirit animals, but I think some of the people they worked with were actually indigenous Native American, and were like, yes, this line is fine for your story so long as you do it in XYZ way, and they did. I looked this up, and I can't find anyone confirming they did have anyone working as an indigenous consultant, but I can't find anyone complaining about the spirit animal treatment either. That doesn't necessarily mean it is or isn't a problem, just that I can't find proof either way. Also, while Life is Strange is leaning on Native American spiritual traditions, it's important to bear in mind that white people don't have spirit animals isn't strictly true because there are multiple different traditions that have a separate conception of spirit animals, such as the Berserker, better known as Berserkers, who are generally white and the few surviving members of the tradition still attempt to channel their spirits, or the shamanic traditions of Siberia, which I assume will include some number of white people, and also channel spirits, most notably the sea duck spirit which is said to be able to access worlds above and below by flying and swimming. A more accurate statement is, you have to be part of a spiritual tradition before elements like spirit animals from that tradition apply to you unless the tradition itself and its adherents say otherwise. AI the Somnium Files is one I've heard super good things about representation wise too. It's a visual novel in the vein of the Zero Escape games, if you heard of them. Same director and writer too. Got a bona fide trans character in there too, who isn't treated like a trash, I'm told. <laughs> so many disclaimers, being responsible is hard work. I can't vouch for anything Vival Zone is suggesting. Also, just so I don't have to butt in again, letting you know that I'm about to mention major releases with Zero Metric for what exactly that means. Oh, as well as Life is Strange, you should check out Tell Me Why for, like, the first trans main character in any major release. Oh, I've heard of Tell Me Why, a YouTuber I watched did a video on it. They also have a lot of ethnic diversity in that too, like, they go into details about the culture of the Tlenkit, rather than just talking about Native Americans in general, like they're one group of people. I explain a bit about Life is Strange and Tell Me Why, mainly that they're story-driven games rather than focusing on actual gameplay. I'm about to mention something that could spoil Life is Strange, so if you want to skip that completely, there's a timestamp on screen for you to skip to. Otherwise, I'll give you a less spoiling explanation, and then give you the chance to skip again. Life is Strange 1 is a bit... I don't know, it has a scene I'm not sure on, but I also get it. Like, not to spoil, but there's a character where mental health is really important for their character development, but it has to battle with the medium being like, your choices matter. Hmm, yeah, I see. So it puts the onus on you to make the decisions that are good for another person's health, because that's just how the genre works. But also, like, 
it's as good a representation as it can be within the genre, in my opinion. Unfortunate, but not necessarily the game's fault, so I can forgive it. Okay, so if you don't want Life is Strange spoilers, skip ahead 15 seconds. I'm talking about a character's suicide and how you, the player, are the only one who can prevent it, which is at odds with the fact suicides should not generally be blamed on the people's friends and the onus is not on them to feel guilty about failing to help the person. Chapter 4. The Limits and Capabilities of Medium and Genre Content warning for brief mentions of racism and homophobia, also a description of PTSD and World War One, but no major details of either. I think this is the problem with a lot of games. No matter how good the intention is, they're limited by the media. And films and books almost more so. There's only so much you can do, so you can't always explore what else could have happened, or what if it were someone else's actions that changed things. See, I don't think the limits of games is the medium itself, but rather the markets they have to appeal to. So you always get very samey structures that aren't fit for the stories these developers often want to tell. I feel like Life is Strange manages to avoid that to an extent, but also falls into it in other ways because it has its own audience. Like, the audience of Life is Strange isn't people who like video games, it's people who like Life is Strange. Games have the benefit of making you tangibly interact with the themes of their work directly and can get their point across in ways that movies and such could never dream of. But the markets, the executives, how will gamer buy game if no shoot? See, Life is Strange manages to avoid that, but also is kind of a victim of its own success in a sense. There were five games in the Life is Strange series, including one that was made by someone else, one that isn't called Life is Strange and one that isn't released yet. I'm talking about Life is Strange Before the Storm, which was made by Idle Minds, not Don't Not Entertainment, The Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit, which isn't called Life is Strange but is set partway through the story of Life is Strange 2, and Life is Strange True Colours, which hasn't been released at the time of recording. And four of them have bisexual protagonists, because that's what the audience expect, and they will riot if there is not one. Except in the game where you were literally a kid, and it's only a very short, free spin-off game anyway. Not that bisexual protagonists are bad, but like, I don't know, when Don't Not made Vampyr, it almost seemed odd because Don't Not have somehow never managed to make a straight white man before that. I mean, as a player character anyway. The tokens, it said, man. Actually, come to think of it, Vampyr managed to have really good LGBT representation and mental health representation as well, on the same characters, no less. Like, it's set in 1918, so there's two soldiers who got trapped in a trench together and they come back with PTSD. But it's 1918. PTSD is not an acronym yet. Also, they are gay and they love each other, but it's 1918. Pain. Suffering. Agony, even. Yeah. And it also manages to navigate, like the beginnings of the feminist movement in the UK, with characters doing anything from quietly admitting to Dr. Reed, aka the main character, that actually they think that women can do just as well as a man, to shouting in the streets about how women should unite. And there's an interracial couple in Vampire 2, but again, not to sound like a broken record, but it's 1918. So that's a thing Dr. Reed could choose whether or not to be tactful about. Also, come to think of it, another thing I've just thought about. There were ways that a person could react in real life, like by calling someone a slur, that you just can't do in Life is Strange, can't do in Vampire, and I think because of that it sort of delegitimizes the bad stuff. Like, it sends a signal to the player that not only is this action bad, it's the sphere of action that is not actually even worth actively deciding whether or not you're going to do it, you just don't? Can't? I, I don't know, I have a more coherent way of phrasing it, but... Mm, I get what you mean, don't worry. So, yeah, do you know how people say that you should never debate Nazis, because even if you debate them and win, whatever that means, you're still implying that their ideas are like close enough to valid to be worth debating? Like that, only with video games. I think that not letting your character do that is 
kind of actually a powerful and arguably clever maneuver because it like separates the incorrect from the unthinkable but I don't know if video game makers realize that's what they're doing in that sense or whether they just don't do it because of course you don't let the player say a slur. I think it's more the latter than the former. SFKD, SFKD. Video game concept, a game where it shows you additional options, but it just has some of them always greyed out. They're not just wrong, you just cannot pick them. There is no way to unlock them. They are just there as dialogue non-options which serve no purpose but to signal to the player these are unconscionable responses that you should not even be thinking of picking. That sounds like something Yoko Taro would do, or has done, or even Suda51, the creators of Dragon Guard and No More Hero slash Kill 7 respectively. Updated version of concept actually, maybe some of them you can unlock if you're evil enough as a character. But there will always be some that no matter what choices you make, you cannot pick them. Big brained, honestly. Maybe you should go into game design. <laughs> we discuss another concept I don't want to release just yet, in case I actually want to make it in future, and then move on to a new topic. Chapter 5. Education, the Curse of Knowledge, and Software Accessibility. Oh, also, can we just talk about, like, how, if you don't know a thing, because you weren't taught properly, everyone's just like, you're dumb. And all the teaching material is always just, always in the wrong place for the starting point you need. Oh yeah, we absolutely can talk about that, I hate it. But like, people always seem categorically incapable of knowing what other people's starting points are. Like, a lot of teaching resources I've seen for literally anything are always either, like, say I don't know how to make videos. Obviously I do because I taught myself, but say I don't. The videos on how to do that will either be, like, assuming you already know the basics, or assuming you don't know what a computer is. People are so incapable of working out what, like, an average person knows. Also, like, We'll assume you already know how to do this thing, you're not an idiot. It's always so cringe, like, what if I don't know how to do that thing because I was never told? Yeah, it's why I always, always struggle with finding tutorials that suit me. <laughs> Oftentimes I just end up giving up because of that. Also, software barely has intuitive interfaces. Like, I do all my drawing in Fire Alpaca, and all my video editing in OpenShot, even though OpenShot is bad, Fire Alpaca is honestly fine, to be honest. Like, OpenShot is very limited in capacity, it's really finicky. If you want to move an element in a circle over time, you have to instead move it around in tiny straight lines one line at a time, unless there's a way of moving it in a circle that I haven't noticed yet. The resizing of stuff is funky, and if you get something just slightly wrong, you make elements clash into each other, but it doesn't matter, because it's obvious what's going on. The menus contain the options you think they contain. The options do what they say they do. Oh, actually, one thing Five Alpaca is terrible at is text, because you have to position your text manually in most senses, including doing column overflow manually, and you can't bold or italic, just one word. I don't know why they decided that was a good idea. But like, again, these things do the job I need and they aren't designed by people who already know how they work, for people who already know how they work. For real, it's why I've always been so attached to Psy. The interface is so simple. For real, it's why I've always been so attached to Psy. The interface is so simple doesn't have anything I need, but like, I don't care. <laughs> it's incredibly responsive and extremely simple to get to grips with. Clip Studio Paint is there if I need something more powerful for design, so it's whatever. But like, there's an effect I can't remember the name of, like a psychology thing, and it basically means that people are always really bad at knowing what other people do and do not know. Like, always really bad at, like, estimating how much the average person understands. 
So if you're good at something, you tend to overestimate how much people know. I looked up and this is called the curse of knowledge or curse of experience. Is that why most teachers suck? Unironically, partially, besides the whole the system sucks thing. But that's also a curriculum thing and yeah, a system thing. Like, unfortunately, if you've got to teach about, say, this one historical event in one hour, and standardised testing means that people need to know X, Y, and Z about it, you don't really have time for any of the useful, like, how history works, and how we find evidence stuff, for example. Although in history, we did at least have some stuff about evidence, different sources and bias. But in science, we never ever got taught the scientific method. Like, what? Why would you not? Yeah, I remember we never did either. (laughs) Why would you just teach science as disconnected facts? The mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Good job, good job. Like, gonna explain what science is or how it works? Also, again, education is made for neurotypical, so pain, suffering even. Also, also, there's a common problem in science of people just not implementing the results of their research, like the findings. So, like, someone will go, here's a way to make people learn better, and the school boards will be like, yeah, but had you considered just doing the same thing we've been doing for 50 years? No one implements new strategies unless those strategies make them specifically more money. The school doesn't get money for educating people. It gets money for making people get higher grades. Which means making them learn very specific things that they will be tested on and nothing else. And the people who do the, like, deciding what questions will be asked, they have no profit incentive to ask good questions, like actually making people explain how science works. It's just, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, ad infinitum. Because why would they bother changing it to actually be about scientific research rather than mindless fact repetition? Like, it frustrates me that loads of people are doing loads of perfectly valid sides, and then it's just not getting used. We talk about his art for a bit, then jump to the next conversation. Chapter 6. Language Usage. Content warning for ableism around autistic people, and also I mentioned incels exactly twice. Note that if you're using the caption system, you might also need to look at the sentence on Discord as well, because I make examples out of the sentences I'm forming and how they're written. Anyway, yeah, people, like, change their tone to match the people they talk to. Like, that's a thing everyone does, but I think it's especially common among, you guessed it, neurodivergent people. Particularly, like, autistic people because of, like, echolalia, where people just literally repeat what people say to them. But not all autistic people have echolalia, and the explanation for why autistic people blend in more is more complicated than this, as we're about to discuss. Unsurprising, JSDKS. But also, like, this can make some uh, high-functioning autistic people actually really likeable, because we just blend into whatever social group we're in and just do stuff like those people. It probably has implications for people getting stuck in cult-like groups with their own lingo, because they actually communicate on a level that normies won't understand. But also, like, maybe if they're thrown back into normie society, they will be re because they'll adapt their language back to normal language. There's too many threads here for me to focus on all of them, but it turns out that language is really interesting, actually. And so is, dare I say it, semiotics. Okay, so I kept normies and be normified, I'm sorry, because normie is actually functioning as almost a technical term here. It means people who aren't part of any of the political or parapolitical subcultures on the internet, pretty much. Renormified is a neologism that means returned into a normie, and that I just made up. Like, what I'm saying in this case is that people who are too deep in a subculture will find themselves communicating in a way that the average person won't understand. I'm not the first and won't be the last to use this comparison, but if you know what the loss meme is, Imagine explaining it to someone else. 
If you don't, try to find out what it means and what the symbolism is. I bet you can do either of those things, but it takes a while. And if you imagine someone talking completely in memes or a particular kind of jargon that you don't get about based chads, no relation to hanging chads, and black-pilled beta cuck incels who LDAR, then even with an explanation you're going to have an uphill battle to explain what exactly the sentence means. This is by no means exclusive to incels or even right-wing groups, and the kind of queer slang that Viral Zone and I are engaging in also counts, hence how I had to just explain what normie means because some of my viewers won't get it, and it's become a part of left-wing discourse, although it's borrowed from right-wing discourse. It's not even exclusive to political groups and can build up based on in-jokes in friendship groups, which is why you have no idea what's so funny about semiotics. S-D-I-J-S-D-J-K, don't say that to our classmates, she'll cry! You're right, though. The excessive media analysis I like doing so much is basically all semiotics. Guys, critical thinking is useful and fun, actually. Ugh, yeah, honestly. Also, like, this way we're talking now, like, if I want to type like this, which, like, I'm only doing because I'm talking to you, again, people change tone to match the person they're talking to. I actually have to think about it, but, like, I'm clearly doing it for a reason. Like, I don't know, comma 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 clearly means a thing that dot 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 doesn't, but it's technically grammatically wrong. And multiple question marks mean a thing too? And there's a difference between T-H-O and T-H-O-U-G-H. And having a full stop starts to mean things when you're in, like, internet speak, where you don't need one for the sentence to be grammatical because no one cares, so you can, like, use it as another type of pause. So, okay, but if you see me do comma, 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 it's because I missed the full stop key and couldn't be bothered to correct it. <laughs> oh, valid. To be fair, I am also copying styles to have seen in other people who talk in this kind of style. Like, you know that normally I talk or type like this? It's a little chaotic, but each use of punctuation is definitely grammatically correct and the sentence structure makes sense. Or at least there's a level of accepted semi-formal grammar, like starting a sentence with or when you technically can't, or using the quotation marks in accepted semi-formal grammar, not to mean something that anyone said, but to lend an air of illegitimacy to what I'm saying and imply that it's not a technical term, but I'm using it as though it was. But like, that style is nice and it looks clean, but doing this every once in a while is, I don't know, nice? If capital letters are no longer mandatory, it frees them up to mean something else, and I think that's beautiful. Very eloquently put. Thank you, thank you. But like, also you have to like, target it to your audience? Because some audiences will know what it means if you use capital letters like this, and some people won't, but most people know the sort of semi-formal style I normally use. The kind of reporter who wants to be a bit cheeky and relatable, but also is still using grammatically correct English because they need every audience to connect with them style. At least for me, talking like this takes active effort, like I said. Like, I will actually capitalise the word I if I don't think about it, and the first word of each sentence, and I had a full stop too. It takes active brain effort to not do any of these things. I'm so used to typing in that, like, I don't know, standish style, that talking like this feels weird. Yeah, you're brave, sick, young. When I'm typing like this, it's just because it's faster. And it kind of imitates my energy when talking, so I guess it's a more accurate representation of myself. I also wonder about how this kind of speech, or typing in this case, frees our mind, maybe? If we don't have to use real words, we can neologize concepts. Is neologize a real word? Hell, I don't know, but neologism is, so I can just decide neologize as a word, and if you know what neologism means, you know what neologize means. It is, so maybe a bad example for the made-up words in case, but I'm sure you get the idea. Oh yeah, for real, I have a much easier time actually being authentic through typing. It's a common perception among neurodivergents that typing makes it easier to lie, but I lie more when I'm talking to someone face-to-face. -face. <laughs> 
Vival zone might have meant about neurodivergence or among neurotypicals here. Anyway, I'm about to talk about 1984, so I want you to know that I have read it on like 95% of the people who talk about it. It reminds me of like, in 1984 they have like, newspeak. You can't say amazing or wonderful or brilliant, they're all just like, double plus good. And they take away like, words for freedom. And in real life, people not really having words for gay and trans and stuff made it hard to talk about that stuff. Like, how can you talk about being trans if trans isn't a thing? This is also very similar to the thing I was saying about PTSD in Vampire. Fortunately for those two characters, the term shellshock was around, although only four years old, even though the term PTSD wasn't. But there's a whole history to how it was treated and understood that I won't go into in detail. Like, so I think that this, like, arena of metaphor and broken grammar rules lets us talk about more things. It lets us inflect in ways we can't in normal text, but can in speech, to be fair. But also it lets us just decide the rules don't match and that unpronounceable things are now words. Like, a keyboard smash is like a word. It's some letters with some meaning, with usually a space or a line break before or after. I've conditioned so much of how I interact with other people based on their comfort. It's only when I'm in super small environments that I can actually match the energy I have on here, which is more me than a teacher in a 30 plus classroom will ever have gotten from me. Communication is whack. It is. Like also in text conversations, you can just like say your piece past each other and then pick up a thing you spoke over, and I love being able to do that so I can finish my thought and move on to the next one. God bless the Discord reply feature for that. Hate how it pings by default if you're on a server though? Like, I know you can press shift to stop it, still hate it. Yeah, that is a bit annoying, but alas. Yeah, but yeah, it's like nice to be able to just say what you want to say and then pick up on pieces of the conversation when you're done with your train of thought. Definitely. Perfect for my speed, at least. We go on a lot of tangents here about things that are too personal for YouTube. Chapter 7. Incomprehensible Scale, The Apocalypse, and Twitter. Yeah, but like the point I was initially making is that the impending doom of humanity is difficult to comprehend, let alone combat. Like, even before the internet ruined everything, even before the Industrial Revolution ruined everything, Increased levels of urbanisation made it so people were, like, unable to comprehend just the sheer number of people around them in the way that they were evolved to do. Hmm, I see your point now. Like, imagine you're your stereotypical caveman or whatever, or even your stereotypical small indigenous tribe person. You know, maybe 100 people, and that's it? And you can't be fully involved with the lives of 100 people, but... It's a number of lives you can comprehend easily. You know when Dave and Jane had a baby and it was great, or how, I don't know, Dan keeps telling the tale of how he won v won a bear and no one believes him. You know these people's life stories. But then along comes, like, not even modernity, not even industrialization. along comes the feudal age, actually even before that probably. You've got the king, who you'll never meet, and all the nobles, who you'll never meet, and all the other peasants, who you'll maybe meet some of a little bit, but like, not much. And then the, I don't know, Spanish invade, and you're meant to comprehend the idea of a fleet of over a hundred ships, but you've never seen ten ships. Like, literally, this me medieval peasant does not know what 130 ships, 2,431 artillery pieces, 24,000 soldiers and sailors? Even is. Like, they just can't imagine those numbers of those things. And then in the modern era, you've got people, like, happily chatting away to their 110 million subscribers? The navy size is the actual size of the Spanish Armada, and the subscriber count was PewDiePie's subscriber count at the time of writing. Yeah, when you think about the physical space that that many people actually take up, Exactly! Like, my following on Twitter is more than my secondary school. That's insane. 
I've seen what a crowd of a thousand-ish people looks like, and you cannot make out individuals after the first two to three rows. It's just noise. So people are talking about issues they can't understand, to audiences they can't understand, on platforms they can't understand. Like, YouTube don't know how their own algorithm works. Because of the AI that makes it do its thing. It's made by an AI. It used to be, YouTube won't tell us how their algorithm works. Now it's, YouTube can't tell us how their algorithm works. Like, earlier I jokingly said I barely used Twitter because if something could be said in its entirety in 280 characters, it's not worth saying at all. But the most important things? Wars, climate change, capitalism, psychology, science... They could be said in their entirety in 280 million characters. God, I wish Twitter gave us at least a thousand. Getting character bios in that teeny tiny character limit in my Reload Rodeo thread is a pain. I feel like Twitter is deliberately designed that way to strip arguments of nuance. Social media works best as a money machine when it incites arguments. Oh yeah, absolutely. We bounce back and forth here until we get to the point of discussing using images to circumvent the 280 character limit. But Twitter knows that people aren't going to do that unless it's like, read this pre-prepared statement please. So they keep most messages short. Which means people are going to cut out nuance, which means polarisation, which means engagement, which means profit. And thus, the cycle repeats. The conversation gets a bit lost again here. Chapter 8. Life-ending responses and the sword of Damocles. Content warning for Twitter hate mobs the prison system, and heavily censored conversations that are still obviously about what I will call intimate abuse to defy any look for a word and flag it bots. Like, I know I'm in the minority, particularly among left-leaning people and the queer sphere, but I actually don't like life-ending responses to people doing the bad stuff, even if it's like, when I was... I didn't report the guy for two reasons. One was that nothing would come of it anyway, but two was because I knew that if he was dealt with properly, he would go to jail for anywhere from two to fifteen years depending, which would just damage him, cut short his education, and prevent him ever making anything of himself. Which is the opposite of what I want to happen. Like, I actually want people who do bad things to fix themselves and move on with their lives, and like, do good things in future. So I tend to see kicking people out of education, the current prison system, etc, as a last resort when people absolutely need protected from a given person. Oh no, I do agree with you, they need therapy, not prison. <laughs> Maybe we should be questioning why this person went on to and addressed the issue at the source. If this sounds crazy and as though I'm just in favour of letting awful people go, just look up restorative justice. It's not a complete alternative to prison, but it's gaining favour from basically everyone because it works. Exactly! And also the, like, typical Twitter response to someone doing the bad thing is... Bad. Like, so bad. Like, yes, that harm can't be easily undone and the victim should never be obligated to forgive their abuser, but that doesn't mean end their life either. The only reason victims fear for their life when abusers are left free is because they know that the system doesn't give a damn about addressing the root cause and protecting victims. Policing isn't about prevention, it's about punishment after the fact. Yeah, exactly. And the same with Twitter cancel mobs who don't actually want apologies, they just want the person's life to be over. Like, not necessarily every person who's ever done that, but, like, the majority sentiment. I do unfortunately know of multiple cases between friends of mine where they were by people with clout and they try to get some accountability, but that's different. Especially shouldn't have access to platforms where they can re-victimise people through parasocialism. Yeah, there's definitely a distinction there, like if someone's got a known history of abuse of people via parasocial relationships, then yeah, they definitely shouldn't get a chance to do that again. But like. I don't know, it feels like currently, if you're famous, it's treated as an invite to dig into everything you've ever said and destroy you over it. Or even if you're not famous and you tweet one dodgy thing one time. Obviously, there's a difference between actual accountability and just trashing people. 
and you should be able to tell the difference and act accordingly. Anyway, I'm skipping over a lot more stuff because it's possibly identifying. There's also the possibility of people on said forums or Reddit or whatever who might suddenly have it out for you and can spin something you said against you. Oh god, so, like, irrespective of your opinion on Vouch, possibly the most brain-dead thing I've ever seen is, he says something like, if you have a person who says you should be able to... that person's opinion should not be entertained in polite society. And of course, someone clips it as, you should be able to... because he said those words in that order, technically. They even had, like, Soy Jack Mean next to it saying, no, you need the context, as though you didn't literally need the context. We discuss actual failings of Vosh for a bit, but this video isn't intended as a critique of Vosh. There are enough of those already for those who want all the details, so I'll gloss over that. But it's sad, to be honest. Like, I sort of want to stay mostly away from political content with YouTube, just because it means that my audience, even if it grows from lefty Twitter, isn't completely made of it, so I don't have the sword of Damocles hanging over my head. But also, I want to make political content, because, um, hello, important? We then get on to talking about NFTs, apparently, but I don't want to beat that dead horse too much. Then we get into some personal stuff. Chapter 9. A Brief Word from the Transgender Agenda. Content warning for sexism and arguable transphobia? I think every assigned female at birth person should just go out in boy mode at least once to try it, to be honest. I think you're right. Like, with the converse, it's, like, often just gonna be hard because people will be like, what the hell? And you don't have the plausible deniability in the same way. Because society loves men enough that it doesn't mind the idea of AFAB people aspiring to male presentations because you should want to be manly and masculine. But like, ooh, girls! Who would want to be perceived as a girl? Ah, oh, the age-old double standard. Yeah! Let me wear a dress, goddammit! We discuss the fact that viral zone should wear a dress, then some other personal stuff, and then eventually we have to go to bed. The end. You can subscribe to Vival Zone on Twitter, they're at VivalZone13 if you want all their opinions on things, or at VivalArtZone13 if you just want the art. Also like, subscribe, and all that good stuff if you want to keep the lights on in this place. A lot of the stuff I mentioned is a rephrased version of someone else's conclusion, so I'll put some links to that in the description. I'm still experimenting with different video ideas at this point, so if anyone wants to discuss things they'd want me to talk about, then the comment section is there. Nein, 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 nein,